Good evening, Ashok. Good evening, everyone. Hi, Vinod. Good evening. Hi, Ashok. And nice to meet you. <laughs> Same here. Pleasure to be here. Presently in Middle East? Yes, that's right. I'm in Dubai right now. Presently you are in Middle East? Yeah, yeah. I could, we could see the background. Wonderful background. <laughs> so we'll just wait for a couple of minutes more. Sure. Few, student, few students are joining. Yes, yes. No problem. Sure. Hello, everyone. We'll start. Everyone can be kindly on mute. Hello. Ashok, in case any presentation you want to make it, that's possible. You are also a co-host now, if at all anything. Sure, sure. Thank you. Any presentation, videos, anything, happy to have it. It's being live streamed as well. So probably those who are not joining through Zoom will be watching through LinkedIn or YouTube channels as well. Just for your information. Yeah, wonderful. Hi, Sandino. Glad to see you. You're from Sudan. Welcome to our session. We'll start in a minute. From South Sudan. That's great. Yes, thank you. Enjoy the session. James, are we good to start? James, you there? Are we good to start? Yes, yes, we are ready. Ashok, we'll start. All right, Pino. Good evening, Ashok. Everyone, every participants, welcome to uh, My Logic's uh, professional talk series. Uh, today, we are extremely happy to host uh, Ashok as our uh, you know speaker, uh, and uh, you know the this will be an, an and you know you will be a very thrilled session. I'm super excited uh, having Ashok uh, here on with us on our session. Uh, before we start the session, I'll give a brief uh, introduction about Ashok. Uh, very exciting, detailed profile. I can speak for 15 minutes on that. But to just to summarize, uh, 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 Ashok started his career post-engineering uh, and MBA with uh, Samtel and then moved to BEL for a short tenure. And the major break happened when Ashok joined Hindustan Unilever Limited as an area sales head. Subsequently, he has moved as a director level at Coca-Cola. 
Coca-Cola Limited in India uh, uh, and followed with uh, an amazing career tenure with uh, uh, Tata Tea Groups. And subsequently, again, um, uh, you know, he moved uh, to uh, Disney Hotstar uh, at uh, executive VP level. That's the time, you know, in fact, uh, I was listening to one of Ashok's session, his, uh, the challenges and, uh, you know, all, all his uh, experience came in, you know, that's the time where uh, this IPL was moved from India to uh, South Africa that particular season. And the experiences of handling that such a mammoth event, Ashok has, uh, you know, uh, was heading that uh, particular uh, season. And now personally uh, heads the entire business for uh, uh, C Entertainment Groups. Ashok, it's indeed a great pleasure uh, you having with us. And, uh, you know, there's a group of audience who are professional aspirants, predominantly, you know, those Let's who are uh, doing various professional programs. And uh, they will be, I'm sure they will be very much excited with uh, uh, our communications uh, as we move progress. Thank Once again, thanks for joining with us. Thank you, Vinod. Uh, my pleasure. Um, I can only say that, uh, Vinod, uh, we've known each other now for actually eight years. I was just thinking that it's it's almost a decade <laughs> now that we've known each other. So it's not a short period of time. But... Uh, uh, I'm really uh, an admirer of the kind of work that you do uh, and, the, and the kind of uh, motivation that you provide to young professionals, especially in the area of accountancy, finance management, and the entire profession itself. Um, and therefore, uh, really happy to be here at MyLogic's professional talk series. I'm also delighted to know that there are people from uh, various parts of the world here on the call. and. Uh, I wish this would have been in person and uh, you know I could have taken on some questions but you know if if time permits maybe at the end if there are some specific questions we'll be more than happy to take them absolutely ashok you know it's all show is all yours we have just moderating that uh, so with permission we can start uh, ashok the first part would be you know the topic you know the what we selected today is also very 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 unique and very interesting and you know I always notice that you come up with some you know, unique ideas, you know, whenever there is a proposal or business, you know, Ashok have a knack of it. So similar here, it's something AI to AE, we discuss about artificial intelligence to always employable. And this will be most hot relevant topic for youngsters who are listening to this. So can you give insights about why such topic? What What is the strategy behind that? Or, or you know, would like to, you know, the crowd will be allowed to hear that. Sure, you know, the, so, uh, you know, let's try and keep this interactive, you know, if there are questions or points that you want to make, please do uh, feel free to come in between because I've always believed that uh, over a period of uh, working for the last 25 years, conversations lead to progress and it's not, you, uh, you know, uh, learning uh, is not always unidimensional in terms of the way it's, it's looked upon. Uh, before I jump into the question that you really asked, Vinod, uh, you know, I'd like to start off with a with a small story. It's not even a story. It's actually a, a conversation that I had a few months ago with someone who's been a mentor in the industry. And this is very relevant for all the young people who are looking to start their careers in various uh, sectors uh, that are available. This conversation was about careers. And so it's so very relevant to all of us on this call. This person told me that over the last 25 years, careers have evolved. You know, when the time when I was starting out or you know, you were starting out, careers were like a tunnel. You entered a tunnel and then you came out of the tunnel after. So there is some. Can you hear me? Am I audible? audible? Sorry, there seems to be some disruption. Um, is it audible? All right, thank you so much, uh, Sana. So I'll continue speaking. So I was saying that this conversation was about careers. And the question was uh, 25 or 30 years ago, when people looked at careers, they looked at it as a tunnel. 
uh, you would enter from one side and at the end of 25 or 30 years, you would come out of the tunnel at the other end. A decade or so later, careers evolved into a series of tunnels. So you would enter a tunnel, go through it, come out of it, then again get into another tunnel and then come out of it again after some point of time. And so over a, over a period of 20 or 30 years of working, people would have actually gone through four or five or six tunnels in their career. Today, and what's more applicable going forward, if you were to look at the next 15, 20, 30 years, careers are not more, not so much about tunnels. Careers have become actually mazes. And therefore, in a maze, you go around uh, trying to figure out how things have changed in the environment around you and how you need to adapt. And for most of us on this call, as you, you know, are on the verge of starting out your professional careers, I think the big thing that you need to realize is that as you go through the next decade or so, jobs will evolve, the nature of industries will evolve, and therefore careers will also evolve. The implications, of course, are that you will need to then keep abreast of what's happening with regard to change, not just technology, but also soft skills. And that's the only mantra for success as you go forward. That's where this uh, theme of AI to AE came in, which is basically that AI is today a buzzword, uh, artificial intelligence as we know it. Um, and to remain always employable, in a world that's getting transformed with AI, uh, there are specific things that organizations need to do as individual professionals we need to do and therefore the, the, the choice of this particular topic. It's also relevant uh, at this point of time, it's ironic in fact that uh, uh, in this particular week that we are having this series on AI to AE, uh, the, the founder of Microsoft, Bill Gates is in India uh, he is, uh, it's being reported in the news that he is uh, uh, going around and he's very much there. So it's, it's interesting. It's also, um, uh, you know, a very relevant period because AI is beginning to kind of impact us in more ways than one and the future is going to be a whole lot of change. Things like this create tectonic changes and therefore it's only a matter of time before uh, we're going to see wide sweeping changes with regard to a lot of aspects of life. Vinod, are you there or? Um, yes, okay. yes, uh, uh, I'm very much here, Ashok. So I think mean, thanks, that gives a uh, very, very uh, uh, crisp uh, explanation for this choosing this particular topic. In fact, uh, Ashok, I add on to that, you know, as finance professionals, we, we have seen the evolvement happens over the time. See, when, when we started, you know, as a uh, young boy with audit, you know, when we started, you know, I used to see manual accounts being maintained, you know, so I'm saying about two decades back, not too far, you know, people used to write a balance sheet about the biggest of banks in India, then moved on to Microsoft uh, Word, Excel, then we moved on to Tally solutions like Tally, then we on you know today we are discussing about uh, uh, post erp so uh, when it comes to ai uh, i'll be speaking more on that but uh, meantime uh, what are the key skills what are the key qualities of uh, someone in this particular era according to you uh, you know, to make him more employable along with their professional qualification. Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, before one answers that question, one needs to really understand uh, what AI could do to employability in general. Uh, look, the way one needs to look at it is that in back in the 15th century, when the, fifth, when the printing press was first uh, invented, it revolutionized the way uh, knowledge was disseminated and it led to an unprecedented rise in the in the number of ideas literary works culture etc similarly when the internet was uh, invented in the 20th century it ushered in a new era of global connectivity transforming industries empowering individuals 
giving rise to what we call a digital revolution. Today, AI is on the verge of doing something like that. But my perspective on AI today, at least as it stands, is that it is still not a revolution. It is still an evolution. And so the difference between both these is that if it is still evolving, it's an opportunity for us as young professionals, as people who are getting into jobs. It's a trend that is evolving and therefore there's an opportunity for us to evolve in terms of our skill sets, in terms of the attitude with which we are jumping into professions. Given that perspective, uh, you know, if you were to just do a random search in terms of what skill sets are required to look at AI, you'll find all kinds of lists. You know, the Forbes magazine, for example, throws up a set of data points, etc., that are there. Uh, but I'm going to kind of branch out my answer a little bit and make it a little bit more illustrative before I jump into my list of skills that are required. Because it's, as I said, it's important to understand what this means, what this evolution really means. Look, first of all, we need to understand that any change of this kind does not automatically replace jobs. One of the biggest concerns really with regard to AI that is being talked about in terms of employability is, are the machines going to replace jobs? And therefore, are, going to be, are there going to be lesser jobs as we go forward because of the advent of AI? In order to answer that question, think about some examples. You know that at one point of time, banks used to engage what are called tellers. They were human beings who would actually do the jobs of tellers, which is basically accepting deposits and giving out cash. And we do know that a few years ago, uh, in fact, a couple of decades ago, banks started realizing that we could actually set up ATM machines and the automatic automated teller machines basically led to a huge uh, set of infrastructure where people need not actually enter the bank premises but would go straight to the ATM and do their cash transactions. Question to all of us is, with the advent of ATMs, did the job of the teller go out of circulation? Did tellers stop existing? There's a data that, uh, there was a research that was done in the US uh, a couple of decades ago, which basically shows that instead of eating up the teller jobs, on the contrary, what happened in the US in the years after teller machines, after ATM machines came into deployment, is that the number of teller jobs actually went up and not less. Now, why did that happen? It happened because the basic job of accepting cash deposits or giving out cash, that's a very uh, mundane uh, transaction related, transaction oriented work, which lends itself to automation. What it did essentially was that it reduced the cost structure for banks. Banks in their quest for increasing market share across markets, increased the number of banks that were there. They went into the next set of markets and fought for the market share. Given the uh, lower cost and the higher margin, it enabled them to open up new branches and therefore engage more number of people. Secondly, the profile of the teller actually changed. The profile of the teller changed into customer management. Today, if you wanted, if you walk into a bank, you don't see teller, you see relationship manager. And what does that imply? It implies that the jobs have become more evolved into interacting, engaging with customers, either retail customers like you or me, or SMEs, or small businesses. And the job of the teller has evolved into basically somebody who's providing financial solutions, who's able to engage with customers, understand their needs, and recommend the most appropriate solutions. And so here's an example where AI, for example, or I'm, I'm using the concept of AI from a technology point of view, technology did not really lead to job erosion. What it did was it relegated jobs that have a profile which lends itself to easy automation to be done by the machines, while the value add 
move to the new profile which human beings could be. And in many ways, something like the AI revolution is also going to be of a similar nature is what I really strongly feel. It is going to lead to basically a, a, a situation where it is going to kind of change jobs that are more transactional in nature, but it's also going to lead to jobs which are going to be more uh, evolved in terms of profile. <clears throat> from, a, from a financial point of view, one may say, okay, the basics of ensuring your, your accounts are in ship shape or in terms of keeping a log of transactions, preparing your basic p &L statement or your balance sheet. AI could take over some of these. But the very fact that today in, in business, if you start looking at the finance professionals jobs as preparing statements of account, then it's a reductive cycle. What the finance profession is expected to do and what finance managers, and I'm using that as a broad encompassing terminology, is not just maintaining or preparing the accounts. It's about providing management support. It's about management decision making with value added inputs in terms of really looking at that data and throwing up key assessment areas that management could then use to then take decisions that will impact the business. And so what it's really doing is that it's AI is going to really then take over jobs at the lower end in terms of transaction intensity kind of uh, assignments, while the nature of the profile or the nature of the job really becomes one where you need creativity, you need analytical thinking, and you need an ability to forecast multiple scenarios. So, you know, the answer to that question that you asked, the three things that I would define, you know, at a very broad spectrum level is that one needs to really keep abreast of latest trends in the in the in the world with regard to AI. Look at basically how you are embracing AI rather than looking at it as a threat. And looking at these three aspects of how do you upskill yourself in terms of creativity? How do you upskill yourself in terms of data analytics and analytical thinking? And the third one, which I think is the one which is not really evolved and which is at a premium and, you know, employment and organizers are going to look at this in a very uh, focused manner going forward is the ability of professionals to be able to read situations and forecast the future. Uh, you know, one of the things I've realized over the last three decades of working is that businesses have ups and downs. You have business cycles which go up and down. That's not a problem for, for business managers. Ups and downs is not the problem, but the ability to predict when it is going to go up or when it is going to go down and why is it going to go up and why is it to going to go down is a far more bigger determinant than the ups and downs itself. And therefore, when you start defining the role of the finance profession to be able to look at this aspect of it, rather than saying the job is to prepare accurate documents, you've then made the transition to say, okay, this is how I can partner with the AI evolution to become, to look at more prospects when it comes to careers. Thank you, Ashwag. That, that uh, was very detailed and uh, very clear. Probably, you know, connected to that, uh, you know, I'm sure you have experienced the AI uh, evolution. So uh, some practical aspects of, you know, you engaged in some of the, uh, any, any of your uh, industry exposure that would be giving some practical insights to the students. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to start off with uh, the sector that I manage. I'm in the media uh, sector. The media and entertainment world is seeing wide sweeping changes with regard to AI. Correct. Uh, and therefore, I'm going to pick on those, but we can, uh, I'd also like to talk about a few other sectors uh, in, in a little while. Uh, you know, the one statement that I'd like to begin by saying is that if you were to look at do crystal gazing and look into the future, the one thing that I would really say to everyone on this group on this call 
is that going forward, your job won't be taken by AI. You know, if the fear is that your job will be replaced by AI, that's not true. Your job won't be taken by AI. It will be taken by a person using AI. And when you start thinking about that statement a little bit more deeply, you'll understand that it is not the AI itself, you know, the technology itself, which is going to replace. It's basically, if you've not kept abreast of the trends, if you've not kept abreast of the possibilities and the potential of what AI can do in whichever profession you've, you've chosen to go into, that's where the lacunae will emerge and that's what is likely to be the problem rather than really a technology taking over, uh, you know, jobs. Given that, let me, let me give you an example. <clears throat> We went through a very difficult time four years ago when the pandemic happened and we were confined to homes. Work from home became the normal rather than the exception. One of the things that it did to the media industry is that content consumption went, uh, went up through the roof. And by content consumption, I mean television and over the top viewing uh, went up through the roof. People started consuming a lot of content and we saw an explosion in the in the variety, the diversity of content. For us managing the media business across the globe, one of the big things that happened was content started traveling across the globe. You know, uh, you'll be surprised to know that Indian content now travels virtually across the globe. We, we cater in fact to more than 120 countries across the globe. People are consuming content. You yourself know that, you know, how, how you're already consuming people in your families would be consuming Korean content, Spanish content has started coming in. So that's, that's a reality. And people are more amenable to watching content, which is either dubbed or subtitled. Dubbing is a cost element and you will need to dub content before you can make it exposed. For example, if I take an Indian movie and say, I want to send it to China or send it to LATAM, I will need to dub it. Dubbing is a cost. It's also uh, a skill because you've got to engage somebody who understands the language and who understands the intonation of the language. And as you look at the various, the plethora of languages across the globe, it's a pretty complex thing because it's, it's not so easy to find people to be able to translate your, your content. Today, AI is able to do this. The AI algorithms have kind of upskilled themselves to be able to do this in a matter of uh, minutes. Uh, it's still evolving, but I foresee a future where in two years time, uh, AI will be able to capture pretty much all nuances of dubbing content. Now, the concept of dubbing is not that simple as one thinks about it. For example, if I were to say, please get me a glass of water in any language, think about it in your mother tongue, you know, uh, and if I have to translate it that to please get me a glass of water. Uh, how I say it in Hindi or in Malayalam or in Tamil or in Bengali. First of all, the, the duration of the statement would be different across languages. You would use different number of words when it comes to different languages and therefore visualize that if an actor on the screen is saying, please get me a glass of water and I translate that to, let's say, Oriya, for example. In Oriya, you might just say it in two words or three words versus an English statement, which is five words. And therefore, the per, from the time the person has opened the mouth to the time the statement has been said, how do I dub it in such a way that the lip syncing is done perfectly? And therefore, the key thing there is the most accurate dubbing is not as important as the most appropriate dubbing. And this is where AI algorithms are now able to master that and give you really appropriate dubbing so that it looks like uh, that's how it's been spoken. Second, uh, AI can also do dubbing in terms of your own language. So you're hearing me speak in English. And if I were to now dub this and speak the same in my mother tongue, which is Malayalam, AI can do that. So you'll hear the speech rendered, not just in a neutral voice, but in my own voice. That's the second thing that's happening. The third, as you know, is that human beings use humor emotion and sarcasm. AI has still not got there, but like I said in the beginning, it's evolution. It's a matter of time before it, the, the algorithms are able to capture these nuances of uh, intonation, humor, innovation, 
things like sarcasm can be captured. So it's not very far away. And the fourth is, can you do all this real time? So for example, as I speak to you, can you listen to me both in English as well as in any other language that you prefer? I think that's also uh, a few months away in terms of evolution. And so from a, from a dubbing perspective, these are practical four practical examples where it's going to change the entire way we look at uh, the media industry. But that's only one aspect. The bigger aspect is uh, AI is looking to really change the way we create content. Um, I think it's a matter of time before we are going to see interactive content. You know, we are all used to watching content, which is uh, which is a story that is being told to us. But what if you could influence the storytelling itself? For example, at a particular point in a story, in a film or in a series that you're watching, you say, I don't want this kind of a, a, a journey for the, for the hero or the heroine of the, of the show. I'd like it to be in this form. And supposing that there could be interactivity where the user could define where the story goes. This is not very far away. And people are already experimenting with ideas like this. And I foresee that this is something that's going to happen uh, not in the not too distant future. The third thing, of course, is when it comes to music, you know, music is governed by music rights. And so something that you create in India, you take it somewhere else uh, across the globe. You may not have the rights for that part of the world. But guess what? AI can actually dub that music uh, or render or create music which is uh, going to be in that particular, uh, which is going to be amenable to that particular land and language or culture. And therefore, these challenges are all taken care of. Um, last year, 2023, saw one of the biggest strikes by the uh, Screen Guild Writers Association in Hollywood. And that strike really came about because uh, people wanted the ability to create an avatar of, of an actor uh, and then use that avatar to basically act or uh, you know perform in a story, which means that you could actually replace human beings by AI uh, models or AI actors, and that could actually revolutionize the entire thing. Script writing can be retaken up by AI, and that's already started. And therefore, is it going to render the the job of a screenwriter out of uh, employment? Or is there going to be something in terms of uh, reimagining the role? So for example, while if you say that I want a script for let's say, uh, let's say a, 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 uh, the story of a sports athlete, AI could actually throw up that. But if you were to then think about it saying that I want to define, for example, the, the, the story of, let's say, uh, a girl who comes from uh, a lower middle class family battles social and economic challenges to become an athlete at the global level. The, the story in that one line is very clear and AI will be able to generate that. But the emotional nuances, the, the, the challenges that one faces from a psychological point of view, that's the conceptualization which can't be replaced by AI and which is where you need human intervention. But these are the kind of wide sweeping changes that are threatening to impact the media industry. Some of the case studies I've already spoken to you. It also throws up some, some challenges. It also throws up some, uh, uh, it's basically a dilemma that's facing us in terms of, as we all know, we've got issues around deep fake videos that are already going around. There is the issue of cyber security. There is the issue of impersonation, cyber fraud, uh, all these are real issues and uh, which are which are things that are impacting and changing the way we look at the media industry. But at a very bottom line level, just to sum all that up, one of the things that uh, you know I keep thinking about is storytelling is universal. We've always loved to listen to stories through decades of human evolution. The question is, would you be as comfortable listening to a story that is made by a machine as much as a story that is told to you by your grandmother. <laughs> Think about it from that point of view. And that just changes uh, 
perspective. And that's something that I keep thinking about. I don't have an answer to that, frankly, but, but, but that's really where, uh, you know, the moral dilemma of how far AI could take things in the media world lend itself to. Uh, that's from a media perspective, but given this audience, I just want to give two more examples, Vinod, uh, and then stop. One example is from the financial world. See, one of the big things in the media world is IP, uh, intellectual property, how to protect it, and also uh, contracts, because buying and selling production contracts, uh, you know, people don't realize that legal contracts, legal stroke commercial contracts is a very integral part of the media and entertainment industry. And the way you draft them, the way you craft them is, is a very important part of it because it, it's a way of securing the IP that you're generating. Now, when you buy and sell content, uh, you know, today uh, there is always the loss, the fear that you may lose IP, the fear that it may be misused. And therefore, uh, the idea of smart contracts. People have started evolving this, but uh, it's still not progressed to a level where it is widespread. But if I were to kind of look at it over the next, uh, let's say, let's say seven or eight quarters, I think smart contracts is one way of securing IP and it's something that we will have to get used to it. So I really think that gone are the days when people would, you know, transact selling uh, content through either IP transfer or, you know, sending CDs across. It's going to be across on the net. It's going to be real time and secured by smart contracts. So that's something that, uh, and smart contracts powered by blockchain technology. So it's going to be something that's uh, something to think about in terms of an evolving uh, aspect of the, of the work. The last point is with regard to uh, banks, with regard to treasury houses, with regard to financial sectors, commercial employments. I think one of the things uh, that's really going to happen is also that there are going to be new areas of work that are going to be created because of, uh, cybersecurity because of uh, you know your ability to basically look at uh, scenario building uh, so analytics uh, cybersecurity fintech robotics these are new areas that are going to come up and therefore new jobs that are going to happen uh, you know there's uh, just to kind of end that section really i would say that if you were to look at what are the top 10 fastest declining jobs uh, mm -hmm. from a commercial banking area, bank tellers and related clerks would be on my list, cashiers and ticket clerks, data entry operators, administrative jobs, or material recording, stock out, stock keeping, uh, bookkeeping, payroll. These are the kind of things that would be on the decline. On the contrary, what are the jobs that would really be growing, the fastest growing jobs? AI and machine learning specialists, sustainability, business intelligence, informa information security, fintech, data analysis, scenario building, um, digital transformation. These are kind of things that are going to be the fastest growing. Um, and therefore, that first point that I made, which is that even if you don't learn how to write code, your ability to understand what's happening in the area of AI and keep abreast of changes is going to be the single most biggest determinant of how success, successful you are over the next 10, 15, 20 years. That was very, very detailed and very practically to run a show. Uh, thanks for that. Now, probably I take a small pause on AI. We come to the, the next part, always employable, you know, that, that particular part. Here, uh, as I said, you know, the students who are the future decision makers in leading corporates as they progress their career. So here, if you could give some insights from your practical experience, particularly with respect to decision making. I, I know it's, it's a boss career and quote one example may be challenging, but your experience, you know, the situation where you have to make a decision and uh, you know, how you tackle and, you know, that that kind of a, a kind of a case study kind of situation. I'm sure you would have come across. I, I remember the days you have in Star Sports, you used to share me uh, amazing experience, you know. So, in fact, you should know that, you know, where, you know, all of a sudden India decided to move IPL from India to South Africa, you know, the entire things, you know, it was not easy. OK, so those kind of situations you have come across, probably if you can share insights about some of those of your specific experience, a slight post on AI. 
uh, that would give some insights to students and making uh, probably slightly away from technology. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess uh, a lot of technology also kind of gets to you. So I think that that pause is very much required. Look, yeah. there are, I think, um, you know, five areas that one needs to look at in terms of decision making. I mean, at least from my career point of view, uh, I'm going, not going to spend too much of time on that. But broadly, one thing that uh, the first among that is that in any business that you pick, your consumer insight is the biggest determinant, you know, consumer uh, and customer drives every business. And therefore, whatever decision you take has to be centered around consumer insights. Second, it's it's really about partnerships and collaborations. The new world is about partnerships. And which is why you see, uh, you know, industries and companies are not built on the strength of their own fundamental intrinsic merit, but it's partnerships is a new thing. The third thing is perpetual beta in terms of being constantly learning. Data is the new oil and adopt a consistent and integrated approach is my fifth uh, criteria. Uh, having said that, in terms of practical applications, um, you know, when the, uh, when the IPL was uh, happening and uh, two instances, one is the one that Vinod mentioned where suddenly a decision was taken to approve it and move it to a different uh, location. The second is during COVID, uh, how do you then get people into, uh, you know, either doing commentary or how do you create, how do you produce for example, when uh, during COVID times, it led to decisions that I had to make in terms of saying, okay, now this is a new reality. How does one embrace this? And I think most professionals would have gone through it. Things that we thought, cardinal rules that we had built saying that this is not possible, got challenged and got broken during the COVID phase. And one of the big decisions, for example, in my case was, how do you then sit and produce content sports content without physically having to travel to multiple locations or getting people into into multiple locations and the sports world has completely got revolutionized by decisions taken by some of us at that point of time today you'd be you know amazed to know that uh, krishnamachari shrikant sitting in chennai uh, could actually provide real time commentary and uh, you know, uh, sitting at his uh, in a, at his living room could actually provide commentary real time, and that that completely changed the way people thought about producing uh, sports production for television. Uh, that's one example, but there are many many other examples uh, of of a similar nature, which is about breaking the rules. No, no, in, a very interesting uh, statement. In fact, uh, you know, you, some of you would recollect during IPL time, you know, the micro most things. You know, so even the uh, the stadium was empty, but always that background voice was coming, you know, so if the background voice of crowd is not there, uh, watching a cricket will not have the same kind of essence. So to that extent, uh, micro level uh, things were being, you know, monitored and happened during uh, those times. Ashok, now probably the Correct. critical and part. Of, uh, yes, please. Go ahead. Go ahead, Ashok. Please. Yeah, just. To, yeah, sorry. So just to add my two bits to that, one of the things about creating the experience of sports on television is not just about capturing what has happened on ground. You know, when you watch, go to watch a football match or a cricket match, you're not just going there to see what action has happened. The thrill of watching a sports uh, event is also about emotion, is also about reaction. And therefore, the next time you watch a cricket match, uh, and cricket is particularly interesting because cricket every single ball that is bowled is a story it lends itself to a new story because every time you bowl it's an action that is being generated and there will be a reaction either the batsman gets out or a catch is generated or it's hit out of the park for a six but each of that is a story now the story is complete only when you've shown the action but you also then cut to spectators in the ground here's a reaction so you know a child jumps for joy or somebody waves the Indian flag and you know jumps for joy. When you show that, that's the culmination of the story. Uh, now, in a in a situation that we know just mentioned, when there are no crowds in the stadium, how do you then create that emotion? Because without that, the story is not complete. And that's where you create ambient noise. You know, TV productions uh, actually revolutionize the way sports broadcasting is done by creating ambient noise by creating AI and AI driven technology where you could cut through into the living room of a fan and the living in the living room, the fans are celebrating and you cut into that and then come back to the, the cricket ground as well. 
uh, I mean, similarly analytics, you know, people could today, for example, you can not just, uh, uh, you know, I mean, look at it this way. Uh, your DRS system today can actually take over the job of the umpire, right? Uh, <laughs> and every, single, uh, every single decision is analyzed to an extent where it's broken down into exactly what happened. And that's the way uh, it's all evolving. I think uh, it's, it's exciting. It's, uh, it's revolutionary. And I think the future is going to be far more uh, uh, intrusive, but at the same time as a, as a storytelling experience, far more evocative. True. Uh, by mixing, you know, the context, what we discussed, Ashok, uh, quick question to, you know, the aspirants again, I, I reach, you know, I represent them and speaking on behalf of them. A specific question, how they become marketable with respect to their career and a kind of a uh, stabilizing, you know, over the time, you know, how they secure and, you know, a kind of, you know, how, what, what is your thoughts on that? I mean, of course, the AI is one part of it, but overall, you know, so your, your thoughts on how they market themselves to, uh, while they have a professional qualification, you know, they, they are all youngsters with another 25, 30 years of career ahead. So how they can uh, get into as well as be be continuing with it in, in successful colors, colors. Your thoughts? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I'll just, uh, you know, use my experience. You know, when I started out, um, I honestly didn't know where it's going to go. Uh, you know, I had a lot of thinking in terms of ambition, in terms of what I wanted to do. But frankly, I didn't really, at that point of time, understand what could be the the nature of things that I could specialize in and my own intrinsic interest attitudes and skills you know what are the things that uh, as a professional what do I get really excited by and it took a few years to kind of get there in terms of saying this is what I really enjoy doing and this is what I'd like to do and therefore my learning from that really is that as you enter your careers you enter your professions you've got to remain open to possibilities. The beautiful thing about uh, what's happening in the world today, and this is evolu uh, evolving as we speak, is that the sheer number of opportunities are huge, but you need to then be able to be open to uh, embracing such of these opportunities and not making up, up your mind too quickly, saying this is what I want to specialize in, but remain open to opportunities. What does that mean? It means that uh, while you get in and you know your organization or your team is expecting you to deliver let's say a certain part of it maybe five percent of what you are setting out to do is what you're expected to churn out on a day-to-day week-to-week month-to-month basis that's your core job and you know some people think that putting your head down and just delivering your core job is the sum and substance of it all not always i think it's important to deliver that hundred percent for sure you cannot afford to be lax on that but can you also kind of be aware of what are the other things that are happening around in your office in your organization outside your organization in the sector i think that lends itself to being abreast of what's happening and therefore figuring out what opportunities will come your way a lot of startups today uh, you know the startups is the new buzzword in india and a lot of people are you know young people are getting into startups Startups don't happen because you've already latched on to an idea and saying this is the area that I want to do a startup. No, you jump into startups because as you work through a profession, the first few years, you develop certain core abilities and then you realize I can replicate this across multiple sectors. Uh, and that's when you realize, OK, this is what I'm good at. This is what I enjoy doing. And this is where I'm better than the next person. And once you've you've latched on to that, that is your mantra for then building on it and evolving success. So uh, I hope that helps. But the point I'm really making is be open to possibilities and figure out where your success really lies. You know, um, in, in management, sometimes mm -hmm. we we look at decisions using a, a two member a, a two axis grid. Uh, on the vertical axis, it is the size of the price in terms of what is it that I can really materially look at success? And the other is the right to win. Do I have the right to win this game? So you may be very good at, let's say, data analytics. 
is data analytics the right price and therefore what do i need to do to make it a worthwhile career leveraging my ability at data analytics figuring out which sector i want to go to and how do i then make that happen as you progress through the first four five years of your career and you know you have enough time time is your time is your friend it's not your enemy use it to basically refine this thinking and say these are the opportunity areas that i can get into and in a very practical sense some of these things you can't read up uh, i don't think mentors can give you these have to come from within but it will come from within if you are mapping the opportunity and saying this is how i marry the opportunity with my skill set very clear ashok uh, probably uh, maybe i am going little deeper into the question in the interest of students itself so you being as an employer as a you know senior most levels you hire a lot of candidates okay so, so probably what are the qualities you uh, look at a candidate when you choose i am of course the qualification matters but from a uh, student perspective you know to understand it to be so that they could be prepared yourself they don't get very often to interact with uh, personalities like you so it would be good to that know that you know what exactly from a, a senior most level they look at uh, while selecting a candidate yeah that's an excellent question you know so i'll i'll put it this way you know the very fact that you are there for an interview your cv has been shortlisted and you are there sitting across the table it's a reason to be proud of you know it's a reason to feel that you are you've accomplished because you've done your basic understanding your basic subject knowledge your basic capability is not the question mark anymore what differentiates are certain aspects of how you present yourself and of course your intrinsic uh, self one of the things that uh, as as an employer i look for is curiosity you may be uh, you know a gold medalist in in a particular area that you have studied that is table stakes today but are you curious are you wanting to learn are you wanting to develop yourself are you willing to try out new things this persistent curiosity is something that uh, a lot of employers really look for because with the world changing they also want people who are curious and who want to adapt and learn rather than remain status quo that's one thing the second is uh, is your ability to network i think uh, like i said somewhere early up the world has changed from working in individual silos and looking at competence within a function or within individuals to how do you network how do you collaborate to create value which goes beyond what an individual value is and therefore the ability to influence teams the ability to manage teams the ability to work across teams is something which is uh, you know people call it as emotional intelligence people call it as eq uh, but it is to me it's simply that are you just an individual um, uh, contributor or can you be a team player i think there's a lot of emphasis on team playing because uh, it is no more about being able to do things on your own um, look at it this way uh, to give you an example, uh, the CMO's job, the chief marketing officer in, in an organization, his or her job is no more about functional expertise in marketing. It cuts across product understanding, it cuts across manufacturing, it cuts across today's social media understanding, the way the media market, media buying is involved. And therefore, there are so many functional disciplines that comes across that you've got to be somebody who can kind of orchestrate multiple functions and not just become uh, an individual uh, area excellence. Um, that would be the second one. The third is adaptability. Uh, you know, is the person flexible to, to kind of look at the job in a different way? Is there adaptability to say, okay, given resource constraints, can I kind of optimize things and make it better? Uh, you know, a lot of startup organizations today have a formula where uh, it's called uh, a is greater than r a stands for ambition and r stands for resources and that's true for a lot of new organizations your ambition of a founder is always greater than the resources and therefore they're looking for people who will say okay my resources are limited but i'm going to optimize things to make that happen and fuel the ambition and that's something to to really think about as in can you be adaptable to it with adaptability, of course, comes innovation, which is that can we, I mean, people are looking for 
problem solvers people are looking for innovative lateral out of the box ideas and given the 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 kind of resource constraints that are there you need to be able to kind of uh, keep that in mind uh, i'm not going into areas of technology ai coding etc because some of these are evolving and some of these i think we will need to keep updating our skills and abilities as we go along but i think between curiosity energy adaptability innovation um, i think those would be the four five things that i would look for as an employer that's brilliant ashok so in fact uh, you know i was just a quick time we almost one hour flown like anything uh, so, so uh, you know i need to be justifying to the audience also so we'll uh, you know a few questions will take up ashok uh, i know your schedules just uh, probably another 5 to 10 minutes if some questions will uh, take up and uh, conclude with that uh, over to you students uh, uh, thank you for listening patiently i'm sure you get a lot of you can either unmute and shoot or, or otherwise you can put it in chat box over to you Yes, please. You can put it in chat as well. Yeah. Uh, I'll read out the question, uh, Ashok. Uh, this is Mohammed Yunus who's asking the question. <clears throat> we heard you say AI taking over the lower end jobs like Stellar's, but creating new and evolved jobs like Relationship Manager. Do you think there will come a time when AGI will take over the upper end jobs too? Or will we always be take one and give another type of thing? Okay. Excellent question, Mahmoud Junas. I mean, it's uh, look, some of these things are also evolving. And, you know, I don't think uh, I want to portray myself an expert who knows everything about what's going to happen because then I would be a future uh, so, you know, I would have insights into the future, which I don't. Some of these things will, you know, even what I'm saying may prove to be wrong. But I'll give you an example. I spoke about the, the job of a teller because that is something that we all understand and we see in our day lives. Think of, of, of let's say, a profession like a radiologist. You know, uh, what AI can do is that part of the radiologist jobs, which is to read a report, read, read a radiology report and say, then this is the problem. This is the issue with with the human body. This is what is the is the is what needs to be addressed. AI can take that part over. Communicating the problem to the patient, giving him or her moral support, advising a course of action, and then taking care. You know the caregiving. Think about it. Some of those, I don't think AI has evolved into that level where. You can, with sensitivity, with empathy, communicate to a patient or give care. I don't think replacement is going to happen. And I think I'm using that example to then now move up to a principle saying that there will be certain parts of these jobs which can be taken over, but the job itself will never be taken over. What therefore I'm saying is that there will be an opportunity for us to then figure out within the job which is the area that I need to specialize. Once you start bifurcating that, I think that's the way the future will evolve. I hope that that addresses the question. Thanks, Sajo. Thanks for that. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, Shakti Mol have a question. <laughs> very interesting, very uh, personalized question, I assume. You told that you worked with Disney Hotstar and now you see with Z Network. So what kind of differences you see in uh, <laughs> uh, both the companies? So, so that may be a <laughs> very, very difficult question, I assume. <laughs> uh, that, that's a difficult. I didn't expect that question, Vinod. So that, that's a difficult question. <laughs> they they uh, may be very good viewers of it. So probably <laughs> from that perspective. Yeah. Look, I'm going to kind of take the uh, uh, liberty of modifying that question to say that I've worked with multinational companies and I've worked with Indian homegrown companies. And let me kind of define, instead of taking the two specific examples, let me define 
what the differences I've seen between them. Uh, multinationals are basically, I worked for with Unilever, I started out and then with Coca-Cola and then uh, on the Indian homegrown companies, I've worked with the Britannia group and with the Tata group, you know, so let me just brought this, uh, you know, answer that from that point of view. So, and, and let me first take the example of, uh, of something that would be very close to your area of uh, expertise, which is capital budgeting and cash flow management. Let me just take that first. One big yeah. thing that I've seen is that, uh, you know, the, the entire area of uh, capital budgeting uh, is something that is, uh, that is very, um, it's a big area of focus for any company. But when it comes to Indian homegrown companies, I think the sanctity of cash uh, and the ability to manage cash and the fact that businesses revolve around cash in cash out, as most found founders say, is very, very critical. Uh, and therefore, when you look at multiple options of deployment of capital, look at basically what is the kind of recovery period for particular projects. Uh, one of the things is that the Indian uh, homegrown companies, uh, I don't want to generalize, but in, in places where I've worked, I think their ability to basically say that, uh, you know, I'm going to keep a tight leash on cash is, is critical to the organization. Uh, while uh, the multinational companies look at it from a more broader framework in terms of, you know, what's the kind of longer term horizon. Now, there is no right or wrong answer, but the approach then lends itself to the strategy and the execution. Uh, in, a, in a market like India, which is a tough environment to operate in, I think the former works better than the latter. That's my personal opinion and you know, it's something that we could debate. But I think a lot of, um, uh, and that explains why a lot of multinational companies coming into India find it difficult to survive and, and then choose to exit the market. Uh, this ability to keep your uh, feet firmly on the ground is very, very critical. The second is your time to innovation. I think what I've seen broadly speaking is that your ability to spot an opportunity, jump into it, quickly figure out whether this is working or not working, exit or scale up and make it a success is far better than the Indian uh, companies rather than the MNCs, you know. Um, and I think that is something that today startups use this fancy word called fail fast. Your ability to fail fast is a critical criteria for success. What does that mean? It means that when you are a startup and when you have nothing to lose, it doesn't, if you say I have now moved in one direction and suddenly, you know, to use another fancy word pivot, you know, saying this is not how I want to go. I want to go here. Your stakes are so small that you can actually do it. While in a large company, your stakes are so high, you can't really pivot. But the pivoting or the ability to fail fast is something that uh, is again, in the first set of companies, the ability is much faster. And therefore, you'll find that people are ready to experiment, ability to take risks, quicker approvals, faster approvals, and a true spirit of entrepreneurship are higher in, in those is my, is my reading. Uh, those are my personal experiences, but I'll leave it at that. No, I think, I think that was a uh, very, very uh, strategic and diplomatic answer to cover that question. And it, it gives that insight what they were looking for. Uh, any more questions? Anybody? Any questions? You can unmute and ask. Sure. I think one more question. Okay. Uh, sir, one more question. As you see in C recently, C had removed a movie citing religious views, which was produced by C Studios after spending so much of amount. How does it feel to remove a movie? Okay. This is all very, very, very specific. So you, I, I leave the choice to Ashok. If you can skip the question, that's fine. Uh, if it is very unique and specific to business, but in general, if you, I, I leave it to you, Ashok. Yeah, so I, you know, I don't want to get into the specifics of uh, of the of uh, of the question because uh, that's very uh, 
uh, it's something that I wouldn't want to comment in the public space. But in general, uh, what we need to understand is that, you know, when it comes to content, uh, it is storytelling and a story can be told in multiple ways. It can be told from multiple perspectives. Now, uh, it's interesting because with everyone loves to hear a story, but everyone relates to a story differently. You know, the same story that let's say Vinod and I hear, Vinod could have a very different take and I could have a different take. Uh, and in many ways, one feels blessed to work in the media space because the ability to influence and the ability to uh, basically touch lives is much higher in the media world than let's say in specific products that you operate in and therefore one needs to balance out the ability to tell a story from a creative liberty with being able to manage sensibilities and sensitivities and i think that's really the mantra for success Ashok, I think uh, uh, we'll I think we, we'll we'll stop there because we are on time. Uh, once again, Ashok, thank you so much uh, for sharing all your insights, uh, starting from you know the uh, you know why we choose this subject, you know why we choose this AI to EA. Then we discussed about the changing trends which is happening. You know, starting from uh, a kind of a basic level, uh, how the tellers job to ATMs and you know what all changes happening. We highlighted on that. And more importantly, you know, how we adapt to the situation, the changing times, how we adapt. 